welcome back to 3D Dialogue. I'm Jesse Hirsch. In East Asia, a lifelong training and practice of self-cultivation is considered to be a virtue. It is a way of life and moral practice. In Buddhism, one is believed to be able to achieve enlightenment through continuous self-cultivation. Joining me in studio to discuss the notion and practice of self-cultivation is Robert Carter, a professor emeritus in the philosophy department at Trent University. Thank you very much for coming in today. My pleasure. Now, as we sort of intoned in the intro, self-cultivation is not necessarily specific to Buddhism only, but is really a wide practice in the East. Perhaps you could start by telling us a bit more about its sort of generality, as it were. Yes, you're quite right. In fact, we most usually associate it with China, mm -hmm. where both the Confucians in particular and the Taoists are known historically as practitioners of self-cultivation. So what is self-cultivation? Self-cultivation is any sustained practice aimed at one's spiritual evolution. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a Confucian who's interested in the evolution of one's virtuosity, or a Taoist who wants to disappear into the Tao of all things, or a Hindu who becomes aware of the fact that Tat Tvam Asi, thou art that, you are divine. Mm -hmm. Or a Buddhist who tells you, of course, that you have a Buddha nature, mm -hmm. that we are all divine and we all have within us the potentiality to achieve enlightenment or Buddhahood. All of these traditions seek in their practices to do more than exercise, to do more than recreate. It's a spiritual journey mm -hmm. that they're engaged in. And is it generally, I mean, obviously the phrase self-cultivation almost implies that it is done for oneself, but is it within a larger context? I mean, you've sort of intoned how Confucianism and Taoism, Buddhism and Hinduism each approach it differently. How does Buddhism, I guess, practice or encourage self-cultivation? Well, of course, with Buddhism, the phrase is already um, ambiguous. There is no self right. in Buddhism, and yet, of course, there is a self in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. The ego self, the everyday self, the grasping self, the hating self, and even the loving self are all to be let go of in order to find underneath a deeper and more lasting self which is already connected with everything else that exists in the universe mm -hmm. to such an extent that you no longer become my interviewer you become my brother mm -hmm. and I yours so it's a different sense of self that we're talking about when we talk about self-cultivation now what kind of cultivation then are we engaged in? Well, of course, the primary means of cultivation is meditation. Mm -hmm. Meditation is a practice, and it's a lifelong practice. You don't do it in one course. You don't do it to get a PhD. It's your life activity. Mm -hmm. By the way, there's one of the great differences, I think, between much of that passes in the East and in the West. Religion is not separate from life. Religion is living in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So whether you go to the synagogue or the church um, doesn't matter from the point of view of the Buddhist in that sense. All activities in life, if properly engaged in, are practices leading to one's own self-cultivation such that spirituality breaks through. Well, and it strikes me that it's a holism in contrast to almost a compartmentalism that you see in the West. That's that, right. As you're saying, maybe one day a week you go to shul or you go to church. That's right. Whereas it is your whole life in the East that leads towards the self-cultivation. Tell me if I'm wrong in inferring that there's another difference in the relationship to the divine, that you sort of mentioned within Buddhism that we're almost going towards that divine self. How does that juxtapose, I guess, with Western practices under the same auspice? For the most part, it's in sharp contrast to the West, mm -hmm. but not always. See, one of the nice things about comparative studies is that you realize early on that if, in fact, you could not understand what's going on in another tradition, you'd never be able to break through to an understanding of mm -hmm. that other tradition. Mm -hmm. So, for example, what I'm about to say in answer to your question about Buddhism 
is equally true of the Christian mystic Meister Eckhart, mm -hmm. or within Judaism, the Kabbalists, mm -hmm. or within Islam, the Sufi mystics. Mm -hmm. Usually it's the mystics in the Western traditions. So what do we find in Buddhism? We find that each of us is divine. Going back to Chinese culture, and I think it sweeps through the entire East, the earliest primer uh, with that one sentence that you learn how to make your letters with is in sharp contrast to what I learned. I'll ask you what you learned, too. For me, it was run, Jane, run. Run, spot, run. And mm -hmm. for you, similar, probably? Probably. In China, the oldest sentence is a primer, going back thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And it reads, all human beings are by nature good. Mm -hmm. And so the goodness that we find in us, of course it's been clouded over by all the things that human beings do that get us into trouble, but our original nature is divine. Mm -hmm. The Buddha calls it our Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. The Buddha nature is that substance, no, soul, no, that way of being in the world which is representative of the fact that you have been enlightened. Mm -hmm. And so, as the rabbi David Cooper writes, um, we are all godding because right. God is a verb. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as this isolated individual self. Mm -hmm. Each and every one of us has to learn how to be godding just as we have to... As a process. Yeah, and, ha and we have to learn how to self in the same way. A, a very opportunistic part to pause the conversation and break for a moment, but we'll be right back with Robert Carter, a professor emeritus in the philosophy department at Trent University. We'll have more in this discussion after the break. You're watching 3D Dialogue. Welcome back to 3D Dialogue. I'm Jesse Hirsch. And we're in studio today discussing the notion and practice of self-cultivation with Robert Carter, a professor emeritus in the philosophy department at Trent University. Now, before the break, we were talking in general about self-cultivation, and you sort of mentioned meditation as one means of self-cultivation. Perhaps you could enlighten us or some other ways that people are able to engage in that specific practice. Well, there are many practices that one finds throughout the East. Remember that it's all about doing something in a serious way um, as a sustained attempt to achieve spiritual enlightenment or mm -hmm. some spiritual development. So if one turns to the Buddhist in Japan, for example, one finds the practice of flower arrangement, mm -hmm. um, the tea ceremony, or the way of tea, uh, the way of flowers. You see, it's a way. We, we call it a tea ceremony. They would never say that. Mm -hmm. It's a way, a dough, a way of tea. Like a path. Almost. Absolutely. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a journey. And when does it end? Oh, let me tell you a wonderful story. <laughs> The Grand Master of Tea is a man named Dr. Sen, and he's descended from Sen no Rikyu, the very famous real uh, codifier of tea in Japan. And he said, you know, when I was a young man, my father, who was the tea master then, looked at me and said, I will practice tea even after I am dead. To which he said, I thought to myself, my father is a loony. Now, he said, I'm 84. Only one or two years ago did I begin to practice tea by having tea practice me. Mm -hmm. And now I know, Professor Carter, that when I die, I will practice tea mm -hmm. even after I am dead. What does that mean? Think of the expressions in Buddhism. The Buddha is only halfway there. The Buddha? is only halfway there. Um, the Buddha is still improving. Imagine saying that in a Christian mm 
context. Mm -hmm. It would make no sense. Yet there's a certain humility there, I think, that empowers the a practitioner. A profound humility, because it makes you aware of the fact that the path is never-ending. Mm -hmm. Landscape gardening is a path. Poetry is a path. Mm -hmm. Pottery is a path. And if done properly, the martial arts, particularly the Japanese-oriented, uh, originated Aikido mm -hmm. is a path. Mm -hmm. uh, haiku, poetry, that wonderful 17-syllable poetry. The old pond, a frog jumps in. Splash. It creates a snapshot of a precious moment that will never occur again mm -hmm. if you look at it properly. So now look what we've just done. We've changed the way in which we look at the world such that everything that happens, ichigo ichie, is one time in one place. It'll never happen again. Mm -hmm. Our encounter right now, Jesse, is special. It'll never be exactly the same again. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is to be cherished and to be nurtured for what it is, a special event. Imagine if you could have all relationships based on that basis. Mm -hmm. It'll never happen again. It's so precious. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, it really places value on the process itself, whereas I think what Western society often makes the mistake of doing is fixating on the end at the expense of the process so that you lose track of the path that is there and, and you, as you were saying, the path that never ends, quite That's literally. That's absolutely dead on. And if we could only change our perspective, suddenly everything is transformed. Mm -hmm. After all, what is the car one of the cardinal teachings of Buddhism. The Buddha is impermanent. Everything is constantly changing. Everything mm -hmm. is in flux. And therefore, any meaning in reality that is to be found is to be found within that flux. And so the cherry blossoms, as a symbol of this in Japan, are precious. Why? They may last for a week. They won't last for longer. Mm -hmm. They may last for a day. They may last only for an hour if a storm comes up. But they're all the more precious for that very reason. The flowers that are cut in a flower arrangement, they are symbolizing the fact that for a moment, for a short time before they wilt, they are at their height. Mm -hmm. We too are at our height when we understand that we are impermanently engaged in a process which begins with birth and ends with death. Oh, let us make the most of it. Well, and perhaps this comes back to this paradox of the self that, again, we make the mistake of seeing the permanence in the self rather than the illusion of the self. And I guess, to again paraphrase yourself, in the self-cultivation, it is that we need to discard this notion of permanence of self, discard the self altogether to find that inner divine self. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct again. And once you do that, you're, you're not giving up the self. You're giving up the self as a thing, mm -hmm. as an unchanging substance. Mm -hmm. You know, even in existential philosophy, remember Jean-Paul Sartre's work? He said, Utter freedom is the realization that at any moment you can become anything you want because you are not confined by your genes, mm -hmm. you are not confined by your personality. It's what you choose, that existential term, in the moment. The Buddhists were there long before. Make this the best possible moment that you can, mm -hmm. and then follow it with the best possible moment than you can, that you can, because there is nothing in life but a series of moments. Mm -hmm. We are impermanent beings suspended between birth and death, and we live by dying and we die by living. We live by dying because you realize, of course, this, that this interview takes me one step closer to my death, mm -hmm. and yet, Jesse, this interview is how I will live my life with passion and with verve and with excitement. Well, and it is almost by definition the path without suffering because you're able to see that you are moving forward and that the suffering that may be here will not necessarily be with you as you move forward. Therefore, stop resting on the now and continue with the every day, with the every That's moment. Right. And if death does come to me or to a loved one, of course, there is pain and there's suffering, but it's not unexpected. Mm -hmm. Everything is changing. Mm -hmm. Nothing will last. Nothing can be made permanent. Mm -hmm. And therefore, make the best of it, my friend, because this is a special moment, one to be cherished.
Well, and I think this has really been a special interview, and I thank you very much for coming here to speak with me and with our audience. And, and this has been really inspirational words in terms of the, allowing us through self-cultivation to move forward in a joyous and, and really celebratory life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was Robert Carter, a professor emeritus in the philosophy department at Trent University. Next up, a 25-century-old custom called Katina Ceremony. You're watching 3D Dialogue.